Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everybody, this is Brian Smith. I'm back with another episode of Grief to Growth, and I've got with me today, Emily Thoreau Threat. And Emily is the author of the book, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief, a comprehensive guide to reclaiming and cultivating joy and carrying on in the face of loss. Emily has gone through the experience of having two husbands pass away, as well as the deaths of her father, her mother, her sister, many family members and friends. So Emily has had much experience in the grieving process and has learned to face life with love, optimism, and joy. And her mission is to comfort and support those dealing with grief, loss, and fo- grief and loss, focusing on positivity. Emily's earned a master's degree in English with a concentration in writing, which led to her career teaching writing at the university level. So she naturally turned to writing to deal with her grief. She also is teaching those dealing with loss how to use writing to deal with their grief. And when you when she's not writing, you can find her tending to her garden, creating art, and walking on the beach because Emily lives in Hawaii. So with that, I want to welcome Emily Thoreau Threat. Aloha. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you for your welcome. Yeah, it's it's great to meet you, Emily. Um, and we were talking earlier, you live in, in beautiful Hawaii. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that the weather is nice there today. So glad to have you here. Um, I want to just talk to you a little bit about your background and how you got involved in writing about grief. What, what brought you to the subject? Well, as, as you said, I've had two husbands die. And the, the, my first husband that died was a philosophy professor and he's uh, special with ethics, specifically dealing with death and dying. Hmm. And so <laughs> the whole time we were together, everything seemed to be about death and dying. And he taught a class that was required for all the nursing students of the college where he was uh, with helping nursing students learn how to deal with death and dying. And he even had... Um, been with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and he'd been around a long time. He, he was uh, instrumental in bringing hospice to the community that we lived in at that time, that, that just when hospice was first getting developed across the country. Hmm. So um, I say all that because we really were kind of immersed in, in all things related to death and dying during mm-hmm. that time. And he was, uh, he had health problems for probably really bad for the last five years of his life, uh, the last two years. And I, I kind of could feel, and, and we talked about everything, but he never talked about dying. And he had uh, written a, an ethics textbook many, many years ago that would get revised every, he would revise it every two years because it, it was used internationally. Mm-hmm. And he had been struggling trying to get this last uh, edition out that he was doing because it, it was physically hard for him to do things. So we'd been working on it together. And the morning that he finished it, he uh, he was so happy. And it was the first time we were able to uh, submit it electronically. So we submitted it and we called his editor and we were celebrating and it was all, all a really great thing. And he was so happy to get this thing accomplished. Mm-hmm. And then right after that, we were going to have lunch, and then he was going to his dialysis treatment. And while he was having lunch, he said to me, am I going to get better? And I thought, uh, you know, all these thoughts went through my mind all at once. I thought, in all this time and with all his background and everything else, he didn't realize he wasn't doing all these medical things to get better. Mm. That, that he was going to get cured and be back to who he was before. Mm-hmm. And we were always honest with each other. And I just said, no. Mm. And I, I think it, it dawned on him at that point that that, that was what was happening. And uh, within about an hour, uh, when I was working to get him into the car to go to dialysis, he just died. Wow. So I, I think he... He uh, once once the realization came to him that he was never going to feel better than I w- he was right then, 
that he, he was ready to go and he hadn't been until then. He just kept thinking, you know, I'll, I'll just do all the things that doctors tell me to and eat the way I'm supposed to and behave the way I'm supposed to and I'll get mm-hmm. well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. So it's, do you think maybe on some level he knew or he was, that's, that's he, a really interesting question to ask. I, I think, I think he was trying to get his book done. And yeah. I think that was his goal. And when he got his book finished, he was, he was ready to be finished. Mm. But as I said, we, we hadn't talked about it, which I find is kind of strange. And boy, after he was gone, I, I was so lost. We, we'd been married for 22 years. And um, I just frankly didn't know what to do with myself. And, and it um, took about a year before I started to, to come out of it and, and really be functioning again. Yeah. So um, did his the, the work that he had done, did that help you at all? Were you involved in the work that he was doing? Yeah, or? I was involved with, with what he did. We, we were uh, very active in getting people to, find, to sign um, durable power of attorney for health care mm-hmm. mm-hmm. so that they could have their wishes carried out when the time came. And he had, uh, we both had ours filled out and we both had um, DNR that do not resuscitate that, you know, if it was our time, it was our time. Yeah. And ironically, when he died, he was in the process of getting into the car. He sat down on a seat. He looked at me and he said, um, I, I won't repeat it because it was kind of <laughs> not good language, but he looked at me like he realized what was happening at that moment and mm. then he was gone. And in the process, he slid down between the seat and the dashboard and he was stuck, absolutely mm. stuck. And I couldn't get out. I couldn't do anything. I, I wasn't sure what to do. And the only thing I could think of was to dial 911. And after mm. I did that, I thought, shoot, he's a DNR. That was not what I was supposed to do, but I didn't know who else to call. Right. There wasn't a neighbor home around us. Uh, anybody, it, it, there just wasn't anybody to call. So when they got there, it was really hard for them to get him out of the car. And uh, when they got him out, they laid him down on the driveway, they uh, saw that his, he was in atrial fibrillation. And so they decided to resuscitate him. And I said, wait, he's got a DNR. And I yeah. said, you have it? And I goes, well, I, I can go and find it. And they said, we can't wait. And they started right. it. Yeah. And so they went ahead and did that and took him to the hospital. But he was, he was gone. There was, there was no question that he was already gone. So it was, it was uh, quite an experience, but I, I, uh, I don't think he really went the way he wanted to. I think he wanted to be more vital by the time he went, but he mm-hmm. had, had just really deteriorated, deteriorated over two years with two heart surgeries and dialysis and uh, congestive heart failure and yeah. all kinds of things like that. So do you feel like, were you somewhat prepared for his passing or? Well, I, I knew he was, I had been thinking for probably five years that any time he would be gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know specifically when that was going to happen. But so I think I was, I was preparing for it. I was thinking about, okay, what am I going to do when he's gone and how am I going to handle things? And we did things like uh, fixing up the house because it needed some, you know, painting and, and freshening and that sort of thing. And so while, while he was going through all this, we were working on cleaning up the house and letting go of stuff. I was getting rid of stuff like crazy because I just, I knew when the time came, I didn't want to deal with it then. I wanted everything to be clean and mm-hmm. orderly and to have have things, just stuff to be gone. And that's, that's kind of how I was dealing with it in the process because I never knew he he had been admitted to the hospital so many different times in emergency situations that I never knew when that was going to be it. Mm -hmm. Right. We had one kind of uh, might find a little humor in it. He liked Prince, the the performer Prince, for some reason. He just was crazy about him. And he happened to be coming to the community that we lived in for a concert. And so he bought us tickets. And I thought, you know, need to go to a concert. I don't know how we're going to get you in and out of this theater. And everything right, else. Right. He was determined to go. So we went and it turned out um, the town that there wasn't town. It was a city it was Bakersfield in California at that time mm-hmm. um, was not exactly 
prince oriented, more um, cowboy country music oriented. Mm -hmm. And so they hadn't really sold enough tickets. And I guess of the ticket, they gave away a lot of tickets and they still didn't have that many people in this big arena. Wow. And Prince was not happy about it. So he refused to go on until they got more people there. And I happened to know the, the stage crew because I had a theater myself and was I knew the, the, uh, all the tech people in town. And they told me that they were told to call everybody they knew and tell them, come down now for free. We just oh. have to fill up the house. <laughs> okay, for Prince. Huh? <laughs> yeah, for Prince. So about an hour after he was supposed to start, he finally came out and did his concert. And it, I don't think it was the full length it was supposed to be. And... Well, I, we, I got him out of the car and got him home. And there was a message on the phone from the doctor. He'd had lab work that afternoon. And they said, you have to come to the emergency room immediately. And this was like six hours before because of all this length of time we'd been dealing with getting him to the concert and sitting through it and getting him home and everything. I thought, wow. Oh my gosh, what's happening? And uh, so I took him over and they said, Oh, we've been waiting for you. And, we got him in and it turned out his potassium was really high. And um, when your potassium's high, you can just die. That's how they do executions, you know, yeah, you right. die very quickly. And fortunately we did get the, get him there in time and they were able to get it uh, balanced out. But it was always one crisis after another was happening. So I kept thinking, is this it? Is this when it's gonna be, you know, right. what's gonna happen? And, uh, and finally it did happen. So, so did you start writing about grief after his passing or was it later than that? It, it was after my second husband to die that okay. I, I dealt with it by writing. Cause I just, I really didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I um, was at the time I was teaching at, at the university, teaching writing at the university. So I'd, I'd go to work it was, and come home and sit basically, and then go to work and come home and sit. And just, I just felt kind of blank for a really long time. And I had journaled before then, but I just didn't feel like journaling at that point. Yeah. But things were so different with, with my next husband. I never dreamed I'd get married again. I just didn't, you know, I'd been married and uh, I was happy with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then I met somebody who was, um, we were perfect for each other. Mm -hmm. And they were as um, opposite as they could have been. Um, Jacques, the, my husband I was just talking about, was much older than I am. And he was, um, as I said, a philosopher. And he had been Catholic, but he had turned agnostic and, and uh, almost, uh, almost not believing in anything at all, hmm. uh, it, it, which was a huge transition for him. But with studying philosophy, that's, that's where he went. Yeah, that happens. And then, Ron, my, my next husband, uh, and Jacques was uh, French Italian. And when um, my, my next husband was so different from that, he happened to be a religious science minister. Oh, and wow. he was, he was uh, African American and he was absolutely brilliant. He had three master's degrees and had done the most amazing things with his life. And we had, amazing conversations and I learned so much for him and, and really learned to live a different way and we really focused on living in the moment hmm. and by doing that even when he was having his health challenges everything was okay and and we knew it was okay and we knew that when he left it was going to be okay and then I, I didn't need to worry about anything and we just really focused on love. I, I learned to let go of fear because I think that was something that was really holding me back when Jacques died was I was always was afraid of everything. I sold our house and moved someplace else because I was afraid of the neighbors mm -hmm. and fear was kind of driving me. So with with Ron that I, I really can say I, I don't really deal with fear anymore. And I focus on, on love and very much on living in a moment. Interesting. And, wow. Yeah, it made it easier to do. So after, you know, when, when Ron first died and his, the whole process was pretty amazing and, and beautiful. But when when I found myself alone and thinking, OK, now exactly how am I going to do this? Because we moved to Hawaii two years before he died because he'd lived here a long time ago. 
and he loved Maui and we we visited it we came here on our honeymoon and then, then visited it like twice a year hmm. and finally he said why do we keep going back why <laughs> can't we just so we sold our house and uh, bought a house here all within the period of about a week oh wow uh, made a phenomenal profit on our house that we had no idea that that was going to happen because we'd, we'd only had it for about five years and it, it was it made it so that the transition to move over here was no problem mm -hmm. and it, it was really great living here for those two years but i i wasn't really sure what i was supposed to do and when I, what i found myself focusing on was okay what's my purpose now because here i've been spending so much of my life taking care of two different husbands and yeah. now i don't have a husband to take care of what am i supposed to be doing i really felt like finding my life purpose was was very important and so i thought well i'm going to write about it and i wasn't writing to anybody i was just journaling and i wrote and i wrote and i wrote and the more i wrote the more clear things became and what i discovered was in trying to learn more things about grief or dealing with grief that most of the things that I was picking up or the, the groups that I found online were also sad. Yeah. And, you know, people tend to be just really sad and, and under the situation, totally understandable. Right. But I, I felt like I didn't want to um, live the rest of my life being sad. Mm hmm that I, I wanted to find a way to to find joy, to find happiness, and to have this purpose of, of what I was supposed to be doing. And so I, I found myself writing about this, where where do I find joy at this point in my life? Mm -hmm. What what is good? What can I do? And I, I, uh, with my writing, it was helping me so much that I started teaching writing i just put <laughs> it was funny i put a notice in uh meetup online because i i didn't know that many people because while we'd been in hawaii i was mostly home with him mm -hmm. and i just said if, if you're dealing with grief and you'd like to learn how you can uh, deal with it through writing come on over to my house on this day and time and i had about seven people show up and we became a real tight little group we were first starting to meet once a month and then uh they said we like this so much can't we meet more often so we were meeting twice a month and it was going really well until the pandemic hit and the people that were involved were not real computer people so i i took the group online and, mm -hmm. and still have a group online but then it, it's only got a couple of the initial people because of that i think i think when we can start meeting again those initial people are going to be coming back so yeah they, they really liked it but uh, I still do every every Saturday morning. I, I do a Zoom group online where we, we write about grief. That's really good, and I was enjoying that. But I I got to the point where I thought I need to be doing more. Yeah. And about then, a really close friend of Ron, who still lived in Ventura, um, and was about twenty years younger than than Ron. And perfectly healthy. We were family friends. They lived a couple blocks away from us in Ventura. And he just died one day. Wow. Just, and the first thing I thought about was his wife is going to have no idea what to do that, and what she needs to think about, what she doesn't need to think about, what to focus on. And so I wrote her, I sat down and wrote her a letter and I thought, you know, and this was just a few hours, maybe six, eight hours after he died when I found out that I wrote it. I knew if I mailed it from Hawaii, it could take up to a week to get there. And I, I wanted her to have it right then. I knew if I emailed it to her, she wasn't going to be on the computer right then. Right. So I emailed it to a mutual friend of ours who, who lived close to her and said, could you please print this off and take it to her now? Mm -hmm. And she did. And she told me later on that, that that letter meant the world to her because there, she hadn't thought about any of these things and she didn't need, didn't know what she needed to be concerned about and what she didn't need to be concerned about. So she, she said it was so helpful. And she had two daughters. One was a senior in high school and the other one was a sophomore in college. And she said when she realized that each one of them needed to know what I had written in, in that letter that she read it out loud to them, just, just the two of them. And that it helped them too. And so I decided 
I had to do more that one, one letter was nice, but I had to do more. So I decided that I was going to send her something every week in the mail for the first year. Wow. And I had done something similar to that with a friend who had had breast cancer a couple of years before where I just, I'd either call her or email her or do something every week just to support her while she was going through all the therapy and treatment. And she really, really appreciated it. And I thought it was my relationship with Lori, the, the new widow, that with her, it would be better to send her something in the mail every week. And so I take pictures on, on Maui all the time. And I put a different picture on the front of each card. And then inside, I thought, what am I going to write? So I sat down and in about a day and a half, I had written the content for 52 different cards that kind of took her through the first year, the different things that she'd mm. be thinking about the further and further away she got from um, when he died. Mm -hmm. And she, she just, she cherished him. She said it, you know, kind of kept her going. It was something mm -hmm. to look forward to every week. She knew that it was going to be some comfort coming in the mail. And I had told uh, my step granddaughter about that, Jacques' uh, granddaughter, that I had done that. And she told me that a good family friend of theirs had just had the same situation. They weren't that old and he just died suddenly and she was so concerned about his widow. And I had told her what I was doing. She said, could you make me a set of those cards too? Oh, wow. So I did. And mm -hmm. when I was, and it took quite a while to print them on the computer and cut them and fold them and do all the stuff you had to do. Mm -hmm. While I was in the process of doing that, I thought, I'm just going to listen to a podcast. And I had a, a friend here on the island that did a podcast that I, I knew that I liked her podcast. So I picked one of them out that she was doing. And I felt like I could really relate to the person that she was interviewing. I really liked it. And she had written a book and I thought, I'm going to order a book. So um, while I was making these cards, I went onto her website and at the bottom of the website, she said, and also I am a book agent. So if you have an idea for a book, uh, give me, you know, let me know. So I said, hmm, I have an outline already written. <laughs> I could have 52 chapters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I uh, emailed her right then. And by the end of the day, I had an agent and worked with her and then then the book came to fruition and it was published in January now. Wow, that that's, that is an incredible sequence of events. So I have to ask you, so you, you said with, with Jacques, he was kind of a, an atheist, I think, a materialist. Mm -hmm. um, and sounds like with Ron, he was more much more spiritual. Mm -hmm. How has your spirituality evolved over this time? Well, I'll, I'll take that back a while for me because I, I was raised in a very small town in a very fundamentalist church mm -hmm. and even as a youngster I just couldn't quite buy what they were saying it just didn't resonate with me and I ended up when in junior high school going to uh, the youth group at another church in town where my girlfriend was going and mom and dad said that was fine and <laughs> The people from the, the church that I was going to with my girlfriend called my parents to say, do you know your daughter's here? Doesn't she go to your church? And you know, this sort of thing. My mom got so mad at the whole thing. She goes, you can't go back to that church again. And I thought, here, I found some place where I thought it was safe and good and kind. And hmm. the people there were doing that. And so I thought, you know, not doing church. I think it's the people that are problem. It's not what they were talking about or what they believed. Mm -hmm. but it was the people. So after that, I, I came, I, I knew there was, there was more to life than what I'd been taught in those two churches and that there was more than I needed to know. And I, I felt like I was spiritual, but didn't really understand what that meant. Mm -hmm. So when I, I married Jacques, it was no problem because he wasn't going to church and I wasn't going to church, but I always knew there was something more, something that I was missing that wasn't there. And uh, once I met Ron and we started talking about him and his beliefs and what he did, I thought, now this makes a whole lot more sense to me mm -hmm. to, to believe that essentially God to me is everything, everywhere, everyone's God and everything's love. And that the only real two emotions in life are love and fear. And 
I chose love and that's where I wanted to focus my life. And so when I was writing the book, everything's focused on love there. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can fully understand other religions and other beliefs and I fully respect them. But I, I feel very comfortable in, in my own spirituality and don't feel like I need to be associated with an official religion uh, yeah. or something in, in order to practice it. Yeah. So having gone through this experience twice of, of having uh, mm-hmm. husbands that were ill that you cared for um, and then having them ultimately transition, do you feel like it was, did you learn something from the first one that you applied to the second time or? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, Cause it was, it was interesting when, when I met Ron, he wasn't, uh, he didn't have health problems and I knew about, it. I knew I had high blood pressure, which was common in his situation, but he'd been taking medication for it for years and, and was fine. And he, um, he, uh, so I didn't, I didn't realize that he had any kind of health challenges and he didn't really either. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that he had the same two health challenges that Jacques had had. Wow. They both had heart failure that ultimately led to dialysis. Hmm. And so I learned a lot from what we went through with um, Jacques with all of his medical issues about recognizing things in Ron when they were happening and how to deal with them and how to, to get appropriate help in time so that he could be the most comfortable that he could be as it went along. And I learned... Uh, I learned that, that I, I felt like Jacques somehow wasn't um, wasn't content with dying when he died. He was he was angry about it. Those last two words he said were, were words of anger. Mm-hmm. And I, I could tell he was angry because it was he didn't get finished. You know, he wanted he finished his book, but he he wanted more out of his life. Mm-hmm. Where with Ron it was entirely different. That he he was uh, perfectly comfortable with his mortality and whatever happened whenever it happened was was okay with him Mm. and it it made it much easier for me so that we could we could really enjoy the time that we spent together and make the most of it and it it really was quite beautiful yeah yeah it sounds like one of the one of the big lessons that you got out of going through that um so you talked earlier about being joyful and, and having gratitude when we're going through stuff like this. How does one get to the point where they're joyful and, and, and grateful when we're going through terrible loss? Well, I can tell you, um, gratitude is what started it for me. Um, Ron had, uh, not Ron, Jacques had been gone for about a year. And I was talking to a couple of friends of mine that they, I had, introduced them, we were working on a project together. They didn't really know each other very well, but they, they were both expressing that they were concerned for me because I just didn't seem to be doing anything. And I, I really wasn't doing much. And they both at the same time said, you gotta watch the movie, The Secret. And all right, you know, <laughs> so, but they, they, I thought both of them said it. They're, they're coming from two different perspectives. I thought, I'll, I'll give it a try, you know, mm-hmm. I'll watch mm-hmm. the movie. And the whole time I was watching the movie, I had kind of a, a chip on my shoulder. Mm-hmm. I felt like it was kind of magical thinking and how could this possibly work? And when I got finished with it and I went to, to put the um, DVD back in the, the case, on the, the paper that was in, inserted in there, there was a, it said, um, don't turn this over until you've watched the movie. And I thought, oh, come on, <laughs> you know? So I turned it all over and it said, it was just essentially a, a page with a whole lot of lines on it. And it said, write down what you're grateful for. And I said, I'm a widow. I'm by myself. There's nothing that I have to be grateful for. Mm-hmm. And then I thought about what I'd listened to in the movie. And I thought, it, it won't hurt to try this. So I started writing and I was really shocked that it was really easy to fill up. There was, it was like 10 lines or something on there. And I mm-hmm. thought, I'm grateful for more than that. 
And so I started writing down what I was grateful for anytime I'd think about it. And I got to the point that it was, it was like an addiction. Uh, if I'd be standing in line at the bank, I'd dig a receipt out of my purse to write something that I thought of on the back of it because I mm. wanted to hold on to all these things that we're grateful for because I found the more gratitude I expressed, the better I felt. And here I've been in such a negative mood and I was pulling myself out by realizing I've got a whole lot to live for and my life is good. And there's a lot of beauty and joy and wonderful things in my life. And that's where I need to focus. So gratitude really pulled me out of, of where I was. That made all the difference in the world. We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, growth.com, or text GROWTH, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon.com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now, back to grief to growth. And that led me to the point where... Uh, I, I finally could could be open to more experiences. And mm -hmm. about um, Jacques died in February. And so when New Year's Eve came the next year, I was sitting home by myself on New Year's Eve. And I thought, I've got to make a New Year's resolution that's going to change my life. You mm -hmm. know, it's going to make a difference in my world. And what came to me was to accept invitations. Now... I couldn't figure out why that came to me because I wasn't getting any invitations. <laughs> you know, people just knew that I was moping around, I think, and didn't want me to be a, a sad at their party. Mm -hmm. So I, but I thought, no, I'm going to do it anyway. And I was committed to it. I just said, I'm going to do this. Whatever it is that comes along that I'm invited to do, I will. And I started getting invitations that were amazing really, really interesting things, things that I never would have thought of doing before. Um, one of them was, uh, I was looking at the newspaper, it was back in the days when we read newspapers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there was a, uh, an article saying that they were searching for the uh, editorial board for the newspaper. And that if you were interested in applying, this was how to do it. And I thought, hmm, that sounds like an invitation to me. So I applied and I was accepted onto the editorial board. It was a, a one-year position and it was absolutely fascinating. And I met all kinds of different people that I never would have before and had good experiences by doing that. So it was really neat. And then somebody from the bioethics committee at the regional medical center uh, called me and, and said, we, Jacques was on the bioethics committee for the hospital mm -hmm. and they needed a lay person on, on the committee. And since I was Jacques' wife and, and could come from kind of his perspective, they, they wanted to invite me to be on the bioethics committee as a, as a lay person from the community, a community representative. And that was fascinating work. Yeah. I, I absolutely loved doing that. And then another friend said, uh, oh, I was, I started going to a trainer because my daughter had a friend who was a trainer and she said, I just had to go with him. And he happened to be an ultra marathon bike rider. And he participated in the race across America every summer. And he was getting ready for the, the race that summer. And he said, how'd you like to come with us and be the nurse for the team? Hmm. And I said, hmm, okay. <laughs> okay. So I did that. Uh, it, it was an incredible experience. And then another friend said to, to me that at, at the university, she was one of my colleagues, and she said, what are you going to do this summer? I said, I, I really don't know yet. And I said, what are you going to do? She said, well, I'm taking my sister to South Africa on, on uh, this excursion thing that, where we can learn all these different things. I said, oh, that sounds so cool. I'd love to do that. And she said, well, come along. 
So there I went to South Africa. Wow. <laughs> so it just kept being one thing like that and uh, after another. And one of them was somebody that I'd known before that I hadn't really had a lot of contact with, wanted to go to a lecture at the university. Um, oh, Prejean is her last name, sister something Prejean. Oh, another one we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She was doing a presentation. I thought, well, that sounds really interesting. And so I, I went with her because she didn't want to go by herself. And when we got there, she said, I hope you don't mind that I invited another friend of mine to sit with us and she's bringing her new minister from, from her church. And uh, do you mind? I said, no, no problem. And mm -hmm. when they, they came in and, and she introduced me and I shook his hand, I, I just felt something kind of magical. I said that this girl that was with him, the woman that was with him was really a lucky person. <laughs> and I found out later, I kind of uh, found out later that it wasn't uh, his girlfriend or anything, mm -hmm. that she was just a member of the church that was showing him around the town mm -hmm. and that she had actually was trying to get him together with the girl that brought me oh, so okay. and that that was kind of fun because they they didn't look like they belonged together at all anyway mm -hmm. i didn't think about it anymore and didn't see him again until several months later uh the same friend that convinced me to go to south africa with her said you've got you've got to start dating again you just have to do it i said i you know how am i going to do that and she goes well go on match.com I said, you go on match.com. She wasn't married either. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> and, and she just, she didn't let it go. She just kept saying and saying. And finally I thought, there's a reason that she's telling me this. And mm -hmm. so I wrote down a list of everything that I wanted in, in somebody. If I was going to go out with them, they had to have all these qualities. And if they didn't, then I wasn't interested. And after I, I did that, I posted all the, the about me, all about mm -hmm. me on, on match. And Within a couple of hours, I got this response from the sky and I looked at it and I read it and it was, it was almost exactly my list. Interesting. Wow. It was so bizarre <laughs> that it was, it was everything that I was looking for in a relationship. And I looked at this picture and I thought, gee, he looks familiar to me, but I don't know why. Because this was maybe nine months after that lecture at the university. Mm -hmm. And we ended up... Um, going out the, the first time for dinner. And I know you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to just go for coffee or something the first time right. you meet somebody. But we ended up going out for dinner and we're together ever since then. We just knew when we first got together that we were such a good fit and had so much fun together. And he was, he was absolutely wonderful. And he was really great. And it was probably two or three months later that I said, you know, we met each other before and he was the guy at the, the lecture wow. that I met at the lecture. Mm -hmm. And that, and I remembered that, that handshake and stuff. And it was, it was interesting that, that I felt that way then, but then just right. never saw him again and didn't really think about it again. But then that, that was, that was him. Wow. So I've got to ask you, how do you feel about soul planning or, 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 predestination or whatever in, in our lives because i've seen i'm seeing some really interesting patterns as you as you're saying this uh well i i kind of um believe in that everything happens for a reason i know mm -hmm. that sounds kind of trite but there's there's too many things too many things of synchronicity that mm -hmm. happen that that i don't believe that things just randomly happen. I, I, I believe that that somehow we're we're um, called to do it, supposed to do it, um, whatever it is. That that there are things that uh, I, I hadn't put a label of soul planning on it, but I I can see that. And and with dealing with people who uh, have experienced loss, I I can see a lot of that. It, it seems logical to me. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it just seems interesting that the parallels between your 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 first husband and your second husband and their illnesses and and their different approaches to their passing and then you know how your approach changed and it sounds like you were destined to be with with the, the guy that you met on Match.com and mm -hmm. it's interesting when you, when you kind of talk about putting that or 
accepting invitations. This is the second time I've heard this in the last couple of days. So this is wow. one of my synchronicities. <laughs> Someone was saying they called it the surrender experiment. Someone I, I follow on Facebook. I was just listening to a, a bit literally yesterday, a video that she recorded and saying to put it out there, just like, I'm going to accept the opportunities to come along and, and see what happens. And she was challenging people to do this for a week or for two weeks. And then literally today you, you say this. So um, I think to it. <laughs> there is something to setting that intention to saying, I'm going to be open to what comes along and just, you know, and, and say yes and, and see what happens. So, um, that's yeah, I guess it's really interesting to say that. So when you started writing about grief and you, you teach people how to write about grief. Mm -hmm. So the first question I have for you is some people say, well, I can't write. So what do you say when someone says to you, I just can't write? Don't worry about that. You know, just, just come and, and do what you're comfortable with when we're together and nobody else has to read it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you choose to share it, you can. And every time they share, and it, it's amazing. Once they start hearing what other people have written, they, they want to share what they said too. Right. And it, it, uh, it's, it's really quite amazing. Um, one of the, the writing practices that, that they most enjoy, and I've used it in, in a, a bunch of different ways, but the initial way that I had them do it was, um, and there's a term for it. I just heard the other day that I didn't realize that term existed. And now I can't remember what it was, but it's, uh, it's apparently nothing new, but what I had them do was write a letter to their loved one who died. And I, I say loved one because some of them were kids that died. Some of them were uh, moms. Uh, it wasn't all like widows in the group. There was a variety of people. Mm -hmm. So I said, write a letter to your loved one who died and tell them anything that you didn't get to tell them anything that you would like to have asked them in anything you want to say to them and, and write that letter. And I, I give them the time to, to do that in the group. And I always write along with them. And then when they're done, they don't know what's coming, but when they're done and then they say, you know, sign them like a letter with love in your name or however you would sign it to that person. Mm -hmm. And when you finish that, what you do is turn it around and write a letter back to you right then from that person while all this stuff is fresh in your mind. And don't worry about what you're gonna say, just write whatever comes to you at, as you're writing. Mm -hmm. And they do, and they generally, a lot of them are in tears by the time they finish the letter. Yeah. And they, they said that they, they felt like they were able to resolve things that they had been thinking about and couldn't figure out how to deal with. Uh, they felt comfort from it, they felt love from it, they felt like they their loved one still was uh, a presence in their life that they didn't realize that they were that close mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they they absolutely love that exercise and yeah it's uh it's a it's a great thing to do with them so that's usually what i get them started with and once once they do that they're kind of hooked <laughs> yeah <laughs> whatever i come up with they, they're in for it and and uh and it's different every time. It's not not a set schedule of different topics that we do. It's it's whatever seems to be appropriate for that particular group at the moment that they'll write about. Yeah, it it sounds like a form of automatic writing. Um, that's the word. That's what I heard was automatic yeah. writing. That's that's what it is. Yeah, that, you, you, you can do it in several different ways. It doesn't have to be just the person who died. Right. There there are several different ways to do it, and um, it's, I I just finished a book reading reading a book about automatic writing, and and that's one of the things that that people do, and what a lot of us don't realize, according to this this author, and I believe it too, is when we write that letter back to ourselves, it's actually it's our loved one speaking through us, and I think that's why people become so emotional about it because they realize that 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 they can still tap into that person, that they're still available. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's it's amazing, really. That I just see the the change in the people uh, that I'm I'm just uh, kind of surprised by. When one of the people had been dealing with the loss of a, a loved one, I won't say the relationship in case she happens to listen to this, mm -hmm. uh, but the loss of a loved one years before and hadn't been able to uh, make peace with it. And by doing this, it changed her life. It made a huge, huge difference for her. Mm -hmm. And then writing uh, sometimes to someone who's died in a uh, sudden, tragic sort of um, 
situation like the, the a podcast I was just listening to you with uh, I, can, I can't remember her name where her husband or not husband her son was killed in an accident Dolores um, Dolores yeah mm -hmm. and and how she was dealing with that when you don't get to say goodbye you don't have any idea that it's coming uh, doing this kind of writing can help you kind of pull things together and, mm. and kind of uh, work things out that you didn't have a chance to do in person. Yeah. It's really good in situations like that. So in, in your book, I know there, there are like 26 practices that you mm -hmm. offer in your book. What are some of the practices besides the, the automatic writing we just talked about? Well, they do that and there's, uh, well, there's actually 26 different things and mm -hmm. there'll be things like, uh, meditation and mm -hmm. a lot of people just aren't familiar with actually meditating and so it's kind of a kind of a beginning introduction to meditation uh it's how to uh write affirmations and how to deal with affirmations um it's uh oh there's so many of them. I should pick up my book and look. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they, they're different things where they can actively be involved in something. Right, right. And one of them is like if, if they're feeling closed off and alone and, and haven't been around people, then it has them create an event. Oh, wow. That they can have people come to. Okay. And it goes through the process of creating that. And of course, it's a little different with the pandemic, but right. they still can, can create something where they mm -hmm. can uh, get people together and uh, have that social interaction. And I think that came from me sitting by myself so much that I could have done something about it had I chosen to. And I can see how, how big of a difference it can make when people do that. Yeah. So, and journaling, I have them do just plain journaling, regular journaling. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, it sounds like it's, um, not sounds, but it, it's something that's extremely helpful and extremely needed because as you said, when, when Jacques pass, you like, when this happens to us, we don't have any idea how to grieve mm -hmm. with no one, no one teaches us how to grieve. No one teaches us what to expect. Uh, we don't know is what I'm feeling normal. Um, you know, all those questions that, that the people that I talk to, you know, on a daily basis, you know, we're just, people are just lost and, your book is a guide for people, uh, something that says, okay, you can take an active role in this. You don't, you don't have to be passive. And I like the way that you, you know, said, okay, th this is what I'm going to do. And the intentions that you set and people can learn, you know, I, I would say people can learn two ways. You can learn from your own mistakes or you can learn from other people's. So it's always better to learn from what someone else has gone through rather than having to go through it ourselves. And that's just one of the great power or one great the benefits of being able to write and being able to read to pass that knowledge along. Yes, it's, it, it's, I love doing it. And I, I really feel like I've got a lot to do with doing this because I want, I want to help and, um, comfort and support as many people as I can, mm -hmm. however I can, whether it's with the writing or reading the book and having them do the exercises or, or have, have speaking in two groups so that somebody will hear something and go, oh, I can do something about this. What, however I can do it, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. And I, I just got to tell you an experience that happened to me just last week, a week ago. Sure, yeah. Um, I live on the side of a volcano. So when you either go down to the valley or you come back up to get in, in and out of the area where I live, we call it up country in Maui. Mm -hmm. And there's one highway, there aren't very many highways on Maui, which is was kind of surprising to me when I got here from the LA area with all the freeways and everything. Right. But this is a divided highway that's got two lanes on each side and a, a grass divider in between. And I was driving home in the middle of the day in the slow lane and there was kind of a lot of traffic because the tourists are starting to come back to the island and so there's a whole lot more people than we've been having so mm -hmm. uh being especially cautious and my son was in in the car with me sitting in the passenger seat and he said oh my god or something like that and i i looked to my left and there was a pickup truck that had crossed the divider in the fast lane going to fast speed coming right at my side of the car. Wow. And it just, it was, I, I will never get rid of that picture <laughs> that I'm I sure. saw right then when it happened. And you don't really have time to think. And I, so what I did was I just 
held tightly to the wheel and I slammed on the brakes, hoping that from what I saw that maybe we could, I mean, I couldn't, there was no place I could go to my right. There was no place I could get out of the way and I couldn't have gone fast enough. So I thought if I could stop that maybe that had happened. And so I stopped and I felt this bump on the car shook. And then I decided to open my eyes and see what damage had been done. You know, I, I just knew I was going to see him there and there was going to be blood and people and everything. Wow. There's nobody there. And I thought, I didn't imagine this. I, I saw this and I was hmm. shaking so hard. And, and Jason, my son said, no, you saw it. It did happen. Wow. And so as I was trying to get out of the car, two, two other cars had pulled over and there was all this stuff all over the freeway. Apparently it was, it was in a big windstorm and the guy in the back of his pickup truck had lots of loose stuff and it had, had flown up and it was all over the freeway. And so because of that, all of the traffic slowed down really slow and they were being really cautious to drive around this stuff. And these two cars that pulled over were, were right behind me and they with seeing him coming down the wrong side of the, the freeway toward them, ran them both off the road, but the rest of the people weren't affected by it at all. And I said, was there a truck? I could swear I saw a truck. And she said, yeah, look down there. And there were guardrails um, in between the two sides of the highway mm -hmm. for, for quite a ways. And he came right before the guardrails is when he, he passed in, into me. Mm -hmm. And he kept going the wrong way until the guardrail stopped and he could pull over. So once they pointed it out, I could see him pretty far away. Wow. And I got to see him get out of his truck and start picking stuff up and be throwing it into the back. And so I could tell that he was okay by the kind of movements, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't see him. I couldn't have recognized him if I had to. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at my car, my car that I bought brand new in November. <laughs> and it just had some kind of like a scrape mark on the driver's side uh, fender and broke out the tail light on, on that side and ripped off the, the trim on that wow. side. And it was about $3,000 worth of damage, but that all it was. I, with him coming that fast, I, I didn't see how, how the car or, or us, especially we're, we're going to be walking away from it. Yeah. Yeah. And when I got home, I, I decided that I was going to post what happened on Facebook and all these people, people I've known my whole life were responding either that Ron or Jacques made it not happen the way mm. it was going to, because you still have work to do. The, the work that you're doing right now is so important and you've got to work on that. <laughs> it mm. wasn't time for you to go because you, you, uh, you need to be helping the people that are grieving. Yeah. And people didn't need to be grieving you right now. And that's, that was the response. And I had tons of people respond and they all gave me that same message. Wow. Wow. So it was, it was a, not that I needed reinforcement, but it really made me think, yeah, I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing and I'm helping people who need to be helped and I'm grateful to be able to do it. Yeah. Wow. That, that is quite a story. And yeah, sometimes we do, we, we all need reminders, you know, we all need mm -hmm. reminders here and there. We, we get caught up in, in the day to day and, and sometimes we forget, you know, that there's something else that's, that's bigger than us that that's in, that's in charge. Um, I know last year, 2020 was a, was a rough year for almost everybody, you know, in one way or another. And I, and often when we talk about grief, we think about death, we think about someone passing, but um, could your book help people that have gone through other things besides losing a loved one? Absolutely. Um, Cause I always say grief and loss or grief or loss, because it could be anything like last year in particular, a lot of people lost homes, lost jobs, lost incomes, um, lost uh, friendships or being able to be with family, lost being able to, I, one of my, my uh, friends just had her first grandchild born and she, she was able to go, he was she was in another state from where she was. She was able to go be there with her, her son, the father of the baby. But the, the, and she was glad she was because the father was not allowed in with the mother while she was in labor and, and during delivery. He wasn't able to experience that with her because of the COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, we've just gotten so used to dads being able to be part of the birth process that that's, that's a really big thing to miss out on. And that, that's a kind of loss. And I'm going to do a talk um, in a couple of weeks to a Breast Cancer Survivors Association. And the, the woman who called to ask me to, to talk, she says, you might think it's kind of strange that we're asking you to talk, but losing a breast is loss. <laughs> and I said, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. you're, you're losing part of your body, it's a significant change for the rest of your life and it's loss. And you can deal with loss in the same way because you're, you're grieving those things. You grieve the things that, that you don't get to do or uh, that you lose, just like losing a loved one. It's, it's uh, very similar. And I've, I've been coaching a lot of people through that sort of thing, talking to people through that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I, to me, grief is loss. It's, it's mm -hmm. we associate it with the loss of a loved one, but it could be the loss of, of anything, anything that you, that you weren't ready to have go out of your life that goes out of your life. And as, yeah. as you said, it could be lots and lots of things that we've all been through yeah. recently. So I think your book yeah. is, is very timely to have come out at this time to help people with stuff like that. Yeah. So many people have said that when they heard my book was around me and said, you sure did perfect timing for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it, I have no idea when I started. But <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think things work out the way that they're, they're supposed That's to, right. you know, I think that I, I truly That's believe right. that. Well, Emily, we're coming to the end of our time together. Um, I really appreciate you, you, know, you sharing uh, your, your life with us, your, your story with us, your, your, your book. Um, anything, any last words you'd like to say to the people that are listening? I, I think um, the big thing is for people who are dealing with loss or with grief is to remember to take care of themselves because that, that so often gets, um, and speaking from experience, uh, especially with the first time through, I really wasn't taking care of myself and I couldn't really get better until I started doing that. Mm -hmm. So just be gentle on yourself and take really good care of yourself, love yourself put yourself in, in good situations where you can be supported. And that's just, just critically important at, when you're dealing with loss and grief. Yeah. I think that's really profound. And I, and, and I think especially not to stereotype, but a lot of times women are the caregivers. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times when people are caregivers are not really good at, at receiving care and you might feel guilty about, you know, I, I'm being selfish. Um, and I tell people, this is the time to be selfish. It's, this is the time to take care of yourself. You, you've got to, because it's, it's so, it can be so draining, you know, the, the energy that it takes out of you. And, and, and with that, um, you wouldn't doubt about women. And, and I find that with me, and it's, I'm sure it's different for you, but with me, it's mostly women who, who come to me for help. It's the, the men a lot of times don't seek help. And I, I, one of the things I'm so impressed with you about is that you're a guy and you're doing this work. And I, I'm hoping that men will reach out more. Maybe they need a man to talk to as opposed to a woman. And so it's, it's, uh, it's important for, for all of us to be able to be available to the people who need us. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting uh, because we all have trouble seeking help in, in different ways. My experience has been 80, 90 percent of my clients are women. Um, yeah. And I just happened to be talking with someone the other day. It's a, it's a male who's an executive executive director of a grief organization. And we were, we were, we're experiencing the same thing. So women sometimes have trouble, you know, doing the self-care, but men don't even bother. They don't even know that they need healing. So it's yeah. really um we need to find a way to reach the men too. I, I completely yeah. ag agree with that because a lot of times guys just try to just try to bear down and get through it. And it's really important to process, you know, all the feelings that we're going through. Yeah. They've always been taught to, to be strong and, and uh, not crack that shell open so that they can get some soothing. Some comfort. Yeah. So Emily, let people know where they can reach you if they want to find out more about you. My um, website is the same as my book title, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief.com. I also have a Facebook group, that, group that's Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief that they're welcome to join. And awesome. I'm um, on Instagram at Emily underline throw underline threat and on Twitter at um, whatever that simple is. And then um, 
<laughs> I can't remember it. Something thread, e thread, or Emily thread. I can't remember which one it is. But I, I do lots of social media. I write a weekly blog uh, that's available okay. on my website. Awesome. I, I would be happy to have people read, and you can sign up there to get it my little newsletter delivered once a week. It's not a, a big thing, but it's enough of just a reminder of uh, different things that you can do or think about that can bring in comfort. Yeah, I don't. Or I want to remind people about the title of the book. It's um, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief, A Comprehensive Guide to Reclaiming and Cultivating Joy and Carrying On in the Face of Loss. And uh, Emily, you're a great example of how we can you know, not only survive through these tragic events, but we can actually thrive and, and find joy again. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I, did, I just love to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it shows. And, it, and uh, I really enjoyed our time together. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. So that does it for another episode of Grief to Growth. I sure hope you enjoyed it. If you like this content, make sure you subscribe. So click on the subscribe button here and then click on the bell to receive notifications and click on all. That way you'll be notified whenever I release new content. Thanks for watching and have a great day.